As you know, we are gathered here for our fourth annual celebration of the John P. Glasser Health Informatics Society. Many of you in this room are very versed with our school's activities. But for those who do not know, let me give you a very short introduction about the school, only a few slides. The problem is that I have more slides than our keynote speaker today. <laughs> but let me try. <laughs> okay, we are the School of Biomedical Informatics, one of the six schools at the University of Texas Harrison Center of Houston. As you can see that we have medicine, nursing, dentistry, biomedical sciences, and public health. We are, apparently in Texas, everything has to be big. We are, I think we are the biggest one in the country and probably in the world in terms of faculty and a student body. And we are, UT Health is part of something much bigger, University of Texas system, which has 14 institutions with eight academic units plus six health care units with two others as part of the academic units. And everything here is big, as you can see from the numbers. We are, our endowment is only after Harvard. We have 31 billion endowment for the entire system. Of course, we have a lot more students than Harvard, right? And we have about uh, more than uh, 236,000 students. I think the size is only second to University of California. So I always use a quote from our governor, Governor Abbott. He always tells people, I have more power than Vladimir Putin because the GDP of Texas is bigger than Russia's. <laughs> That's true. I just let, let you know if we are a country where number 10 in the world. So that's the size of Texas. Okay, and on the other hand, we are also part of the Texas Medical Center, which is a really untraditional, unconventional complex of medical institutions with 56 institutions in a two square mile area. And we always count the number of doctors by five per square foot because there are 23,000 doctors on this land. Huge, right? So all the orange ones are the UT affiliated, including the six schools of UT Health, plus our sister institution, MD Anderson Cancer Center. And for the biomedical informatics programs, there are about 60 to 70-ish across the country. We are the only one as a freestanding school, the biggest one, of course. And here we have students, we have faculty, uh, 55 plus minus five because I can never count where number changes all the time. And we have a very comprehensive suite of uh, pro academic programs from five course graduate certificate programs to master's program to two doctoral programs. One is the traditional PhD for research focused students. Another one is a brand new doctor of health informatics which is an applied doctorate degree. We just started the first cohort this year. I think all of the 11 students are in this audience. So we are so proud of you to be the first class. And of course, we do research. Uh, as you can see from our side, we do all kinds of things. But if you look at the top, we cover the entire biological structure from molecules, genes, cell, to, image, uh, to imaging organs, individual populations. And the green ones are research centers. They cover different levels of structure. The green ones are really applied course that support everything we do. Okay, so that's our vision for the school, transforming data to power human health. Okay, that's a very brief overview. Uh, I don't think it lasts as long as our keynote uh, speaker's uh, presentation, even if he has two slides now. Okay, so uh, now uh, let me just tell you a little bit about the history of the John P. Glasser Society of Health Informatics. In 2016, uh, the society was initiated by UT Health School of Biomedical Informatics and uh, to recognize the expertise and the leadership of John P. Glasser uh, who is a universally recognized thought leader in the field of health informatics. 
So the John P. Glasser Health Informatics Society was created to acknowledge innovators in the field of health informatics and provide education, collaboration, and uh, networking opportunities for the broad community of health informatics professionals, clinicians, and students. I vote the Nelson, a notable health information technology innovator, was accorded the first 2019 John P. Glasser Health Informatics Innovators Award. Dr. David Bayes, a patient safety expert from Harvard, was the, was the recipient for the year 2017. And last year, the former president and CEO of HAMS, Steve Lieber, he was the awardee. So uh, now let me turn the podium to John so he can introduce our honorable awardee today. Thanks, Joshi. Uh, as you might have gathered, I'm John Glasser. It's a pleasure to be here in front of you. Uh, I looked up the other day the definition of the word innovation, and it's effectively uh, an invention at scale. And so whether the invention is a technology, a process, a standards, or a business model, it is something that has had a, the scale where it impacts in a meaningful way an industry, a society, et cetera. So that's what we acknowledge in this award is innovators, in other words, people who have had an impact at scale, uh, substantive impact. And while early in many, many ways, uh, FIRE has already had that kind of impact on the industry and the delivery of care and all that we seek to see uh, in healthcare, both in this country but also globally. And so there's more to come, I'm sure as Graham will remind us as we go through here, but nonetheless, uh, to someone who and whose uh, contributions and, as he'll point out, his team and his community have had a scale. So I have, I'm going to go through this here. Uh, actually, have yellow lined the things to make sure I don't remember here. So uh, nonetheless, it is a pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Graham Grief as uh, for his incredible contributions, and the word incredible is written here, and it's inappropriate that it be written here, uh, to the advancement of health information technology, specifically as it relates to interoperability between EHRs and other classes of, of the technology that we employ. Now, for those of you who don't know Graham, uh, he is the founder of HL7 Fire and is the Fire Product Director at HL7 International. Uh, Fire, which as you may know is the acronym for Fast Health Interoperability Resources, is the leading healthcare data exchange standard of the future and was developed by the healthcare IT standards body known as HL7 or Health Level 7. And Chuck Jaffe, who is the CEO of HL7, is here today, along with some of his HL7 uh, colleagues here. Um, now, HL7 International is a nonprofit, or not for profit, uh, ANSI accredited standards developing organization dedicated to providing a comprehensive framework and related standards for the exchange uh, and integration and sharing and retrieval of electronic health information. Now, Graham's got an extensive uh, and uh, diverse background uh, in laboratory medicine, uh, vendor software development, uh, clinical research, and open source development. Uh, so now, since becoming a consultant in 2011, he has conceived, developed, and sold interoperability and clinical documentation solutions and products in both the Australian but also the global markets. Now, in addition, uh, he has worked to develop standards and solutions with several U.S. vendor consortiums as well as national programs or the national programs of Canada, uh, England, Singapore, and Australia. Now, since 2011, uh, he has served as principal of Health Intersections, which is an integration interoperability consulting firm based in Melbourne, uh, Australia, as you might guess. Previously, he held multiple positions focused on interoperability and standards development uh, with Kestrel Computing, including Chief Technology Officer, a National Development Manager, and Product Lead. Now, early, earlier in his career, he was a clinical researcher and a cl clinical biochemist at St. Vincent's Hospital uh, in Melbourne. Now, he's been designated a sort of recognition of, uh, of his work by a number of uh, organizations and bodies, including the Australasian uh, College of Healthcare Informatics, or FACI, or uh, that's the right way to say the acronym, FACI, uh, credential. And for his substantive work, Graham was awarded the Health Informatics Society of Australia John Hilton Award in Primary Care Informatics, and this was in 2015. 
the Don Walker Award for Effectiveness in Health Informatics, uh, 2009, uh, and the MAACB Examiner's Prize uh, in 1992. So a well-acknowledged, uh, an accoladed person here. Now, in addition, uh, as you probably know, in this country, the passage of the 21st Century Cures Act, which had a remarkable contribution on the sort of fate, direction, and progress of IT uh, in this country, in effect, uh, acknowledged that fire would be the standard for the interoperability and the basis for interoperability. There's others, the HIEs, et cetera. But nonetheless, that standard will become increasingly the bedrock and that to the point where it winds up in law, you know, is law in this country. We're still waiting the rules and regulations to make sure all of that is manifest and clear. But nonetheless, uh, the work that he and the community have done have now officially, or certainly toward the U.S. government, which is about as official as it gets, although sometimes I kind of wonder in this country. But anyway, uh, for the time being, uh, it is a, the bedrock. Now, in addition, as a founder, he is, you know, and it goes with the uh, accomplishments that he's had. He's a true visionary. He's got farsightedness, determination, and ability to marshal international intellectual capital, focus on interoperability, are reshaping healthcare in the way that we know it. And it's not only the exchange between uh, sort of EHRs, which is sort of the, in some ways the way we think about it, but it's also the enabling of a very vibrant uh, and well-developed ecosystem of third parties who will sort of surround, augment, and extend uh, the core capabilities of a Cerner or an Epic or eClinical Works or whatever you happen to have. So both that exchange, uh, but also the creation of extraordinary, or unleashing of extraordinary innovation that will surround uh, all of this. More to come here. As you will see, he is, and we're going to show some videos in a second, so, but not quite yet. Uh, he is respected and beloved by the fire, uh, his community colleagues. And uh, we have a couple of videos. Do you know this that we're going to run? Um, <laughs> all of a sudden, it's racing through his mind is, uh oh, where was I when these were being filmed, uh, et cetera. So, uh, just as I said, uh, both of respect but also affection. Uh, so, wherever Marcus, wherever you are, uh, it's time to run these three.
as you may have read, Graham Brief is the recipient of the 2019 Glazer Award. Graham Brief! <laughs> That's it. There you go. All right. So, Graham, please come on up here, sir. It's a pleasure. It is my pleasure and my honor to uh, give you this award and induct you into this society with all the rights and privileges that go with that. But there you go. It is a thank you, it is a Well done. But thank you, sir. Thank you for thank all you that you much. do and all that you've done. Thank you, thank you. So, uh, Graham now has a lecture entitled The Power of Standards to Change Health Outcomes. And so, without further ado, sir, they're all yours. Put it on, eh? Yes, you better, sir, put it on. Otherwise, the podium won't work. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, first of all, thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, Shaji, the University of Texas. It's uh, an honour. I'm not exactly sure how all this happened, really. Um, and, and the thing is, the list of people that I would need to thank is just so long because it's not my award. It's our award. It's us, the community. Um, HL7, the fire team, or the... People sometimes ask me, how many people are in the fire team? And I don't know. Because it's not a listed group, it's just whoever wants to be to the degree that they want to be. And, but it's thousands of people who contribute. Um, we have 7,000 people signed up to our instant messaging platform. That's an awesome number. And, and so many people deserve thanks, but, but I'm going to single out a few special people for special support um, over, over the years. And, and I think the, the first group of people I really want to thank, well, actually, some of my work colleagues, but most of all, Kevin, and I'll come back to Kevin in a few minutes. I thank Kevin for um, making me into what I am. Um, and, and he was, for many years, for 15 years, he was my boss. Um, and, but, but then, when I started with this idea, I, two people jumped on board. The first followers, the critical first followers, was Lloyd and Ewart, who were in the photos. And Lloyd's here. Thanks, Lloyd. Um, but early on, our radical idea really was really radical, and, and there was one person who shepherded the idea through the um, treacherous organisation uh, background that was HL7 at the time, and that was Chuck. Thank you, Chuck. It, it was critical that that happened. And, and I think, you know, those, those were make or break moments for what we did. But then... We started and we grew and, and now there's just so many people. So thank you to all of those people. Um, I'm going start, to start by telling you a very personal story that is, the, for me, the power behind all this. So, so I, you saw, I, I grew up on a farm and I thought I was going to be a farmer, but I accidentally... Ended up in healthcare, and I really enjoyed healthcare, and I knew that I belonged. But it was an intellectual belonging in healthcare, and and I liked working in healthcare, and I was intellectually engaged. 
And I was working in a lab, and then I did clinical research, and then I switched focus and became development lead for a vendor and got involved in HL7. But along that journey, my wife and I decided to have children. Such an easy decision and such an incredibly difficult process for us. By the time I finally held Mel in my arms, it's our oldest daughter, we had five miscarriages and one stillbirth. That, that was painful. That, not, in a way I had never understood before. Much, I mean, much more painful, painful for Kath than for me, but, but it's painful. And I spent ten years in the spiritual wilderness after that. And, and you know, at times that interfered with my work and Kevin, my boss, Kevin carried me through those times. That was, I really owe Kevin for that. And, and in that time, people, friends, family, they came and they shared with Kath and I deeply personal stories of their own experiences. To, it's part of that healing process. And this kind of was a secret society of women who've lost children. It's very quiet, but there's lots of them. But there was this emerging theme for me in the stories that I was hearing. And, and the theme was backed up when I came to HL7 meetings, when, when I um, travelled the world. We know that the healthcare system is fragmented. That's the word we used. It's fragmented. And there's gaps between the fragments. But those gaps turn into chasms for people and they fall into the chasm. And they can't get out of the chasm. And their lives are fundamentally altered by that or sometimes their lives are taken by that. They don't even know that they fell into a chasm. They think they're getting good health care. But I look at their care and go, no, that was not good. And I guess it was the process I went through that meant that I was ready to hear that, ready to hear those stories, to measure the pain associated with that. And, and also to realise that there's another problem that we're just not dealing with in our societies around loneliness and addiction and alienation. And, and there's actually sort of some root causes to all that. <clears throat> And so I did that, you know, when you do a root cause analysis, it's not hard to list the causes. There's lots of causes. But one of the causes, that's something I can do something about. And that is that the right information is not available at the right time. So many of the things you could do to solve the problem, and I'll come back to this, what's the point? You can't, because you just can't get the information. The support is not there. And that, that was something I was positioned to do something about. So, and I'm going to come back to that a little bit, but, but I decided that I was going to stick my neck out and do something about that. That was a very personal decision that came out of that experience that I had, that, that I was going to do something. And... I could maybe work on one of those problems. You know, I'm not the smartest guy in the room. I don't have the most, you know, the most biggest company behind me or whatever. Um, I mightn't be the making the rightest decisions, but I knew what I could aspire to be. I could aspire to be the committedest person in the room. And that's what I've aspired to be in this process. And... I said, let's just do something different. And people said, yeah, let's do that. <laughs> and they came and said, I said, well, come and do it with me. And they said, great, we'll come and do it with you. And it became, you know, a growing community that was self-seeding to the point where it is today. And, and it, it just happened. And, and many, many people, it's not my work. I just said, let's do this. And other people came and they said, let's do this. And it, 
It self seeds. It's it's a wonderful thing. And it's the passion of the community that will change the world. I think that's true everywhere, but it's true for us. It's the community and it's passion. Now, up here on the fire icon, F-H-I-R, it took me a long time to get comfortable with that. A long time to be comfortable with the never-ending stream of jokes and puns and <laughs> whatever and the marketing videos that you saw that I had to stand for. <sighs> but I've come to understand that that fire icon is a wonderful representation of the passion in our hearts, the determination that we need to do this. We need to make healthcare better. It's for me an expression of my faith, service to the community, that, that this is where change comes from. That we should be civil, not just polite, but civil. We should commit to building public treasure that we all have. We're all richer because we all own it. And, and we should spend some of our time building a better world. And what I want to know is that when it's time for me to put my, put my cap down and go fishing more often, when that happens, I want to know that I did everything I could, that I had done what I could have done. And so that's my determination. Now, for those of you who are here from HL7, how many of you remember the Orlando meeting in 2011? You guys remember that? It was a dark meeting. It was a very unhappy meeting. You guys, it's, it's kind of really weird to look at it back, back there. The meeting started for me with a, a joint meeting between Doug Fritzma. I was hoping Doug would be here for this story, but, but he's not. Doug and John, uh, Quinn and I, I'm not exactly sure what I was doing in the meeting, but Doug at the time was senior scientist at ONC, and it was not a happy discussion. Doug was threatening HL7 and demanding a whole bunch of things, and we had no way of delivering them because we're a community. We just can't not act like a community. We're looking at Doug going, what are we going to do? It was the meeting at which... We had a big meeting, decided what we were going to do. The organisation doubled down on its existing approach. It's a typical organisational trap. Our strategy isn't delivering the goals that we anticipated. We do a little, you know, some kind of consultancy or in a consideration of where we are and realise that we could have executed our strategy better. So clearly that's the problem because we like our strategy. So we execute our strategy harder. Well, that's good if the strategy is correct, but if it's not, you just drive yourself off the wall quicker. And I, I believe that that's all we were doing then. But the meeting as a whole, there was an outpouring of unhappiness about the direction we were taking. Lloyd and I organised an informal meeting of a few people that turned into a meeting of 100 and something 50 people, all of whom were mad about where we were. And, and all the people, I, don't just, I kept track of this at the time, the consultants were losing work, I couldn't find work, and, and there was just, it was not, we were not in a happy place. And in fact, I went home from the meeting and, and I was talking to a Dutch friend who said that they had a Dutch meeting back in Netherlands when they got home, and one of the Dutch guys, who didn't go to a meeting very often, said to the Dutch commu community, are all eight or seven meetings like that? Are they all that negative? <laughs> And, and in fact, I got in trouble at that meeting. For years, for years we'd had what we call a poetry channel. There was a few channel on Skype that a few of us were on that the only contributions you're allowed to make were um, poetry, for original poetry, about what was happening in HL7. <laughs> and, and like a lot of volunteer organisations, some of what happens doesn't particularly seem like a useful thing to be happening at the time. There's a lot of sort of, you know, process. And so typically we were making fun of the process, just blowing off steam, it was fine. But this particular meeting in Orlando, the poetry turned dark. <laughs> um, and we had a series of contributions, and this is from the deep insiders, the ones who've been going for years, and a series of contributions um, that were all basically suicide poetry. 
Um, and so, for instance, Abide With Me is a beautiful hymn written by someone in the last days of their life and, and someone adapted that to HL7 because HL7 is going down. And, and um, Jean Dutot, who's not here, did this incredible adaptation of The Wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald adapted to <laughs> HL7. And it was such a beautiful piece of artwork. I actually published it on my blog, which probably was not really, you know going to make friends and influence people but that was kind of the meeting that we had and I went home from that meeting and said it's just we can't go on like this and I looked in my heart and said it's it's a crossroads for us do do this is the time where I decide whether I care I mean I've been to HL7 for probably 10 years at this stage 12 years and I used to sit in the back and watch those people going up for the Ed Hammond Volunteer of the Year Award, which, which HL7 gives out to the people who have just gone beyond reason and given too much. And there's always a procession up them. And I used to sit there and think, why would you do that? Why would you be crazy enough to do that with your life? I went home from this particular Orlando meeting and I, I thought about it and I thought, this is crossroads for me. I can walk away from HL7 because we're just wasting our time. We're, we're a negative contribution. We, the, you could look out in the rest of the industry and see what was happening in the rest of the industry, and you could see what was happening in HL7, and they just they clearly were a mismatch. And I said, no, nah, I can walk away from that. But you know what? I care. I care about this because of what I just talked about. It matters. It really, really matters. And so I said, okay, well, we'll start again. We'll start, we'll sweep everything off the table, start with empty table and say, what would we do if we actually knew what we were doing? In fact, what would someone who did know what they were doing do? Because <laughs> <laughs> we don't. Um, what would it look like if there was someone who knew what they were doing? I made myself a list of that. Then I went searching on the internet for the kind of things I said I'd find. I found the kind of things I said I'd find. All roads pointed to a um, company here called uh, 37 Signals that developed Ruby on Rails. They were doing really sweet stuff. So I took one of their um, uh, cloud specs and I adapted it to a healthcare problem with as little change as possible. Uh, a few weeks before the next HL7 meeting, I published it and came to the HL7 meeting expecting to get welcomed with heretic, you are not welcome here anymore, leave, which I would have said, fine, I'm out, because that was how I felt. And instead, everybody lined up and said, okay, that's the future, let's go. Let's go. And I mean, not everybody, but enough people lined up and... <laughs> Enough people lined up and said, OK, that's what we're going to do. And, and it's a really simple idea, an open specification based on web technology. Let's bring the web to healthcare. And it's not ro rocket science to, to, to imagine that. Um, and, and since then, it kind of, you know, I had some really, really, I had a lot of respect for, I mean, I, I didn't think HL7 was going the right direction at the time, but I had a great deal of respect for the people doing it. And particularly for Woody, um, who I wanted to mention tonight. Woody was the V3, my, my equivalent for V3. And I, I felt that V3 was not going in the right direction, but Woody was a great guy. And, and I sat down the first day of the meeting and I presented what I had as an idea. We didn't call it fire at the time. And I presented it, and Woody was sitting next to me, and I'm going, I don't know how this is going to go. And Woody turned to me after the end of the presentation and said quietly, so that only I could hear, he said, this is the future. I can retire now. It's an amazing thing for Woody to say. He was such... And so, so the person, you know, the two people that I would recognise as my biggest influences, Kevin and Woody, um, and Kevin, uh, Kevin tried to be here, but it was he couldn't make it. All right. So, as I said, we the community grew and grew and grew and uh, took over HL7. So that's got a most of what HL7 does, and it's gradually starting to make its way into the market um, more quickly than we estimated when we started. A lot slower than people want. 
But people always want what they can't have. So, um, but, but underlying this is a value proposition statement. A really simple statement, which is that information standards change the world. And, and it's really an interesting proposition to live by. I try and explain this to non-insiders. Hey, like my family, for a start. <laughs> and, and people's eyes close over pretty quickly when you try to explain this. Like, an information standard, just, it's, just, it's so far down in the infrastructure, in the stack... And, and for years we tried to actually, I've been trying for years to build a patient advocacy presence at HL7. And I would meet patient advocates, passionate advocates for better handling of healthcare information, like making it available to the patient, among other things. And I'd say, come and join us at HL7. And they'd look at me and go, why? How, how, how do you make... So HL7 is... You give your hand on the lever, but it takes such a long time to move the lever. But when you have... So the trouble is that I, I could sit down, down with John. I'll pick John for this lecture. John and I could sit at the table and negotiate any solution at all to solve any healthcare problem. We don't need any standards for John and I to do that. Right? We, can just, we can sort it out. And in fact, when I sit down with John and sit at the table and negotiate this vendor to vendor, done that many times, information standards are actually kind of painful. They're a tax on that exchange. That's really bizarre that they're actually a tax on each individual exchange. But they are. But if we use a standard, we get more reuse. We get scalability next discussion will be easier and the next one after that will get easier again and and you build not a discussion but a commodity and it's that growth of the scale the economic scale that tilts the playing system away from one-on-one -on -one negotiations towards commodity open discussions which makes it feasible to build open ecosystems where things can emerge, emergent properties. It's that openness that's actually the key. Because, because we are using standards, and the more closely we can use standards, the more effective this is, because we're using standards, we can have new things arise that we didn't have to agree with first. That's the key property of a standards-based ecosystem, as opposed to the one that I grew up in in the healthcare where we agreed on each specific exchange each time. And, and that allows emergent economics and emergent solutions that wouldn't otherwise be possible. And then I take part in so many discussions about some... So I'm fostering these discussions in Australia where I live. Some clinical problem, some healthcare management issue where we could imagine a solution that we could put in place if only we had an open healthcare system. But we don't. I've built, we, the fire community, uh, HL7, have built the framework, but actually it needs to be adopted. But if it was adopted, then there was all sorts of things that we could implement for a tenth of the price or less. One of the things I said when we started working on fire is I wanted to see a 90% reduction in cost. And people laughed and said, well, this is 90% won't happen. So let's just talk about one case. I did this market survey at HIMSS the year before I started working on fire. It was the year of the PHR. I don't know how many of you were at HIMSS in 2010, but PHRs were all the rage. There was, I don't know, 150 PHR companies at, at HIMSS. They're all going, we're going to be the PHR of choice. Um, and, and I was partnering at this particular HIMSS with a middleware integration service company that were in the thick of doing some of these integrations between institutions and PHRs. And, and I sat down with a couple of institutions and a couple of PHR, PHRs and 
talked about help them providing technical expertise. And, and, and then we get a general discussion. I started doing a market survey. What was the total cost of ownership of an institution to PHR um, uh, connectivity connection? You know, legal fees, marketing, um, project management, development, maintenance. And, and I came three or four times to about the same cost. It was in the region of 150,000 US. 15,000, 10% of that. So today, hey, Ricky, you're there. How much does it cost to sign up to Apple Health Kit for an institution? Zero. zero. <laughs> That's pretty big. OK, it's not actually zero because it's still some cost, but you can see the kind of change that you can pull off, right, that you can actually make with information standards. And go back to where I talked about, about gaps and chasms, People falling into them. They fall into them because different parts of the healthcare system are running different agendas without knowing what each other are doing. I pick up my mother in law because that's always fun. Um, my mother in law went to a GP. The GP said, This problem, new problem had arisen. This problem is pretty serious. I'm going to refer you to an endocrinologist. The endocrinologist put her on a medication. The side effects of the medication were not insignificant. It's pretty unusual, not unusual for endocrine kind of medications. She went back to the GP. The GP said, no, 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 that's a bad choice. Don't go on that medication. She went back to the specialist. The specialist said, if you're not doing what I said, why are you coming to see me? And, and everywhere I tell that story, our people are nodding in the audience going, yeah, yeah, I've heard that story. I've lived that story myself. How's a patient supposed to figure that out? That's just nuts. There's a better way. But the better way requires, first, the capability to do information exchange prospectively between the care team. It requires a bunch of other changes in clinical culture and clinical practice and liability and so forth. But first, you need the information layout so that you can do those other things. So we made progress. It's coming. It's not there yet. You go back to what I said about why I'm doing this. We've got a long way to go yet. We don't want to actually slow down and take it easy. Um, but I think that with FIRE, people really believe that we can make a difference and we will make a difference. And, and I guess that's one thing I can take from this award. Thanks, John, that, and, and UT, that... You guys believe that we're making a difference, and I um, thank you for that. And it's endorsement for the community that we are really going to make a difference. But it's the difference that matters is difference to people's lives, and we're not there yet. <clears throat> now, when, when I talk to people about the process that we're engaged in, I say that there's really three legs of the journey for a standards a standard, the, the journey from beginning to end. The first leg of the journey is the actual standard development, the standardisation, the bit that HL7 does with FIRE, the development of um, the platform standard. And we get everybody in the room, sometimes it feels like everybody, and, and, and what is it that we can all agree to that we can make possible? And that's a, an engineering standard that makes things possible. The second phase of the process is that we, smaller communities who can agree to more, national communities or you know, particular solution-focused communities or clinical domains, we get together and say, OK, that's what the platform standard says, but how do we solve a particular problem? We can get more agreement. We can, we can have a little community of use that can come to its own agreements. We publish those and say, this is what our community agreed to. That's the second phase of the process. Most of what we do now in FIRE is actually serving that second phase of the process. And that's for us been more difficult because we own the first phase of the process at H7. It's us. That's what we do. The second phase of the process is spread across a bunch of organisations that we therefore need to interoperate 
fancy that. And standards, an interoperability standards organization actually has, actually has to interoperate with other organizations. <laughs> it's the educational process. And for years, I would say to people, um, well, you know, you can listen to the terminologists, but they haven't yet figured out their own terminology, so do they have any expertise? <laughs> or you could listen to the interoperability standards organisations because they're really good at interoperability, but actually we're getting better at it. Well, it's, it's a hard problem, but we're getting there, and it's the same hard problem of getting people to talk to each other, building a community. And, and so we're still working through that process, and, and that's it's going. Um, it's, um, but it has challenges, so we're still working on that. The third leg of the process is actually the hardest. It's the one that everybody comes to ask me about, and it's, it's actually taking those agreements and actually operationalising them at scale in the market so that it's not something that could happen, it's something that did happen. It's actually the hardest part of the process. Intriguingly, HL7 has no leverage over that part of the process. So we, we are reorientating over time with deliberate push to an organisation that pays much more attention to those legs of the process. But, but really our focus at the moment is on growing into the second leg and making that effective um, and then wondering what to do about the third, really. Um, and, and we'll need partners for that. So, so on that subject, I want you to think about this. Our sig most significant partner in the second phase of the second journey is IAG. But it's no longer a value proposition for anybody for IAG actually to be a separate organisation from HL7. Um, when, I, when I talk to people privately about this, I've never said this really in public like this before, but when I, when I talk to people privately about this, I mean, there's a bunch of missteps in the past. There's a bunch of personal stuff and political stuff all in the past. When the actual value proposition, the first value proposition people tell me for having an IAG as a separate organisation is because IAG coordinates across multiple standards and it doesn't have a stake in choosing a particular standard which would be, you know, it can just choose the best for the purpose. That's kind of makes sense theoretically, but when you actually look at what IAG does, they've fallen in the same trap. Right? They fall in their own trap. If it's an IAG standard, it's the best standard. So kind of, you know, really, we, we can do that just as effectively as IAG. That one we can do. Um, so, um, and then IAG is more focused on usability. Well, great, because we're focused on that too now. So, so, you know, long term we have to say, is, that's just not a value proposition. I have no idea how you would do anything about that. I can see the problems just as well as anybody else can. But, but just step outside that for a little while, step back and say, think about our goals. Is it a value proposition anymore to have separate organisations? Just ask yourself that. What do we do about that? I don't know. <clears throat> but um, <clears throat> one of the most unexpected um, part of the journey for me, the part that was most unexpected is the interaction with the governments and how big a deal that's turned into around the world. Um, so, so talk about unexpected. On Friday, I had a corridor conversation with the Deputy Secretary of the Ministry of Health Information, part of the Department of Health in the Kremlin, <coughs> um, in Moscow. Uh, not a conversation I had ever thought that I would be having. Uh, the, the, the Russian Ministry of Health has set up a national exchange system based on CDA for exchanging clinical health summaries. They, some, they took, you know, got me over to Moscow basically to carpet me and, and, and give me a hard time for inventing fire because it's distracting everybody from implementing the CDA solution that they've built. <sighs> okay. <laughs> this is not what I expected to be doing. And, and honestly, I say to people sometimes, if I'd known where we would end up, 
Um, where I would end up personally, I would have run away screaming at the start because I just I'm not I'm just a jumped up programmer. <clears throat> but it was still it was a fun experience. So don't get me wrong. <laughs> but but in terms of my goals, okay, so I'm in this so that people's healthcare gets better. And whether that means helping governments, autocratic governments, exchange healthcare information about their population more effectively in order to deliver care more efficiently, well, that'll make their lives better. Or whether it means getting information into the hands of the patient, that's okay too, as long as it gets patients' healthcare better. That's, that's my goal. And that's kind of easy to say in principle, but then you end up in these critical conversations where two or three minutes can pivot an organisation. You can really screw that up. That's hard. It's scary. Um, but, but that process that I've just talked about, it's not like we figured things out at HL7. We still have ongoing challenges around how do we pivot from a hardcore standards organisation to an organisation that pays attention to that whole life cycle. We, we've had several misstarts at doing that for HL7 people here the Fire Foundation, which kind of didn't quite go away, and board process to figure out how we operationalise on the vision that I just talked about, and and I can't say that we've figured it out. So that's really good. We have still lots of work to do. It's not like I'm ever going to run out of work, or any of the rest of us are ever going to run out of work to be done. Um, I feel as though we still need to figure out what is the right shape of the organisation, where two, and this is a trap for every one of you and every organisation that you're ever part of, we know what we're doing, we know the path that we're on, and somebody says, are we on the right path? You go, well, I don't know about that, but I know the path that we are on. And it's really, really hard to reimagine and re-envisage what you're doing, but but I don't want any of you to think that I'm being critical of HL7. HL7 is a volunteer organisation. What's worse than a volunteer organisation? I think the answer actually is any other kind of organisation is actually worse. For all the apparent pleasures of dealing with a volunteer organisation, um, and HL7 is a very effective organisation that I've never regretted People have come to me from outside HL7 and said, have you really, haven't you re regretted um, choosing to, to execute fire through HL7? Because we could have chosen, maybe, theoretically chosen something else. But no, I never regretted that. Um, and running a volunteer organisation, I mean, I was really touched by some of the acknowledgements um, talking about the way that we build community because that, you know when I talk about fire to people around the world, I say it's, it's two things. It's a community, it's a technical standard. The, the community is the important part. It's the valuable part. Honestly, for HL7, it's a billion something dollar asset. It's not a dollar asset, but it's, a, it's what we are. And, and that, it's critical to us that we are good at welcoming people, bringing them into the community, growing them. But not everybody is going to be happy in a volunteer organisation. I, I had a good beating from a very senior person in a very senior role in a big government organisation recently. Their whole framework is autocratic. They might not live in an autocratic country, but their framework is. They tell people what to do and people go, yes. And they come to HL7 and tell people what to do, and people go, no. <laughs> you have to actually explain. And they go, no, 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 it doesn't work like that. Oh, well, you are never going to be happy in a volunteer organisation. That is for sure. So not everybody will be happy. But the people who can be happy, we need to be making them happy and welcoming them. And, and that's the thing that I'm most uh, feel... You know, like I said, we don't. We didn't set out to be the rightest or the perfectest, or the. We set out to be the community that grew, and that's what we are. 
Um, and, and so that's a, a great challenge for a volunteer organization is every so often an eruption will happen and to be ready to deal with it. And in many ways what we've done has challenged the organization and in most cases it's uh, been up to the challenge. Um, but, but I think that we have more to say about this yet. If, if I listen to the people who come to us and say, what? Well, people who come to me and criticise where we are or what we're doing or complain about where we're at, there's two significant emerging issues that the people come and talk to us about, to me. First is how slow it is to get to market. Are you, what do you expect? It's healthcare. <laughs> but, you, but you know what? On the other hand, I do regularly present to clinical audiences around the world and, and the clinical people are like, the only thing I want to know from digital healthcare is how it makes the job I have easier. And I, that's the wrong question. The question you should be asking is what will be left of my job when digital disruption's finished with it? But, you know, so few people are prepared to, to have that conversation. So it's a matter of time and patience with people and, and dealing with what's going to be a, a fierce battle to resist that change because it's going to be scary. What I say to people is if you have knowledge and passion and energy but the passion is the most important and whatever role you do in healthcare, the new healthcare system will need you the one we finished with in 20 years' time, it will need you every bit as much as the one we have now because there's just not enough people who do that. And, and in fact, the problem we have is not that we have too many people like that. The problem we have is we already don't have enough and all the forecasts say that will get worse every year. So there's no reason for individuals to be afraid. Institutions, on the other hand, they should be afraid. <laughs> and if they sit there going some kind of mix of regulation and self-assurance of what we're currently doing will tide us through. Nah, it won't. It's going to become evident pretty quick that the old flat-footed organisations will get left for dead by agile organisations powered by interoperability and AI delivered in process. That's not science fiction anymore and it's about to be business reality. So, so for organisations, and, and this is what I say to clinicians, your expectation is that the chain, pace of change will continue as, the, as it always has. But no, I'm very sure that we're at an inflection point. The combination of a whole bunch of things, one small part of which is fire, is, means that we're at an inflection point this, probably next year, in terms of impact on the market. I see things under NDA and I look at them and I go, wow. Um, and, and consistent with the pivot I'm talking about, I'm not talking anymore about healthcare IT things. I'm talking about health changes. That's where the action is going to be. The other thing, so, so yes, people come and complain to me about how slow change is, but Actually, that's going to change very quickly to changing about how slow the change they want is while complaining to me about how quickly the change that's actually happening is. <laughs> the other thing that people come to me and talk to me about is the limitations of what we set out to do in HL7. And this is a, a much deeper issue. Um, in a, a core feature of the way FIRE works, as we said, we don't have any normative ability to tell anybody how to practice medicine anywhere in the world. We, we have the normative ability to tell IT practitioners how they do IT. We, we can do that in the standard. But if we make any normative rules about healthcare, people just go, ah, we're not going to do that. We, we can't do that. And if you listen at HL7 to the conversations in the hallway and in the background and the committees, that's a rumbling issue because so many people come to HL7 to do that. And we said, no, we're not doing that in FIRE. And, and that's one of the reasons why FIRE has been successful. Because you can 
as a government mandate the adoption of fire without having to worry about an ensuing clinical battle of epic proportions. And if you did have to worry about that, you wouldn't recommend it. So I've never regretted the decisions that we made early on to scope out the way fire works that we don't take that battle on. I, I think, I'm sure that we did the right thing there. But there's a time and a place for that discussion to happen. And it's not happening anywhere. I've suggested to some of the clinicians at HL7 that it should happen at HL7 and they could start working on best practice guides for what you know, a really well-run clinical organisation would look like. But that hasn't got any traction at HL7. Do I need to do that personally to get it going? Is it a leadership question? Or maybe HL7 is not the right place for that to happen. I don't know the answer to what the right way to solve this is. I've thought for a long time that the right solution is in the professional societies. To start thinking, not in terms of technology, because this is not an IT problem, and not even in terms of informatics, because that's a meaningless word for most people. They can't get their heads around. But to think of it as basic record-keeping um, quality requirements. What records do you keep in your clinical practice. There should be professional rec rules, not recommendations, professional rules for the kind of information you keep for your clinical practice. Now, some professional societies around the world have really effective rules for this already. Um, I'll call out this is uh, the American Society for Obstetrics and Gynaecology. Um, they do, paper-based. Nothing wrong with paper. Um, but very few organisations, clinical organisations, be in, begin to understand the value proposition here. So if they don't understand the value proposition, does that mean that we should do it? I don't know. Who should? So, so sort of maybe if you, you know, and is it a problem I should get involved? I'm a clinician. I'm, I'm close, but I'm not actually clinical. So I don't know, should I, should I think this is a problem I should take on because it's kind of critical path for what I said my goals are, but I don't know. I think I'm interested in discussion on that. All right. So we started small. We just imagined that we could build a better technical standard Early on, it became clear that we needed to focus on the sociological process, not the technical, to, to focus on Tuchman stages of group development, which are forming, storming, uh, norming, conforming, performing, if we're lucky. We, we do that. We, we made that a key part of what we do. It's tied it as well as we've grown so that we have some parts of our organisation running in late norming mode, others still in early storming mode. Um, it's been an incredible journey. I want to call out that we've brought, we've brought a new group of people to HL7. In fact, uh, I was going to comment on this earlier. Um, this last HL7 meeting, which is where we run fire from, had 800 participants. That's twice what we used to have. It's, I, I was still meeting friends, close friends that I've talked to over 20 years. I was meeting them on the last day of the meeting. The meeting's so big that I hadn't seen them. Just didn't happen in the past. And it's really changing the nature of what we do. And I wonder whether we need to do something different because of that. Um, and it's, it's kind of, you know, as the community grows... Somehow the operations the way you operate has to change. It's like a company growing, but a, an, an open community is just a different beast. So it's going to be an interesting process. But, but one of the new communities that's come is the evidence-based medicine community. Of all the things that we're doing in fire, I suspect that that's the one that will change healthcare the most. It's the furthest over the horizon, clearly. It's well over the horizon. But imagine a world where 
your information base, your semantics, your code systems, your terminologies, your um, system is auto-reflective. That is all available for computation. All the systems are built based on that. You have a seamless um, patient administration system and billing system, um, pre-authorizing on the fly. It's all totally seamless. These are things we're working on now. Nothing, you know, those are, they're not in the bag, but, but you know, they're just around the corner. Um, where the patients have a clinical record, the patient has the clinical record that you share. You've got your own record about the patient, but the patient has their clinical record. You can imagine that today. There's people building, not the technical framework for that, but the liability and the policy framework for that now. And, and you have, in addition to that, you also have an interoperable system for your care planning process. You'll plan the kind of care that you give, your, um, you know, uh, the guidelines on which your care is based, the evidence on which the guidelines are based, all interoperable, um, the kind of patient cohort that you see and the outcomes that you get on the patients that you see. All of that published and available, secure but still available, so that you can say, how is this institution performing? How are our guidelines doing? Are they best for patients? What is the overall patient journey? We can imagine that now. It's clearly going to take us 20 years to build it. It's not like we're going to run out of work anytime soon. But we can actually imagine that happening now. And that vision of a fully integrated healthcare system from the most the semantic biological base all the way through to policy interpretation, that to me is the information base that supports the integrated care that gets back to where I started, I talked about people falling into the chasms. Let's stop people's lives falling into chasms. Let's actually focus on coordinated care. I'll stop there. We will just such short discussion time for Q and A. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm.